first of all, thank you to the Research Council for this kind invitation, and thank you to Stig for being in the background there. Uh, I, I am going to talk about cardiovascular applications primarily, but I'm going to show one cancer application. I'm going to talk about uh, the history of the virtual physiological human in Europe. So this is a summary of what the VPH is, the formal definition on the left. Uh, this article from the Telegraph is very old, 2006, but Marco Vicciaconti was interviewed by this journalist and was asked what it was all about and basically he said, well, it's an experimental uh, animal on which we can do research and not go to jail. So that was the bottom line. Uh, if, if we talk about the VPH, we must recognize historically that uh, it, it, it arose at about the same time as the IUPS Physiome Initiative. It's not an accident that the logos are very similar. Uh, but of course, there was an imperative to separate uh, the European vision for the direction of this program. I'll talk about that in a minute. But if there are three words that describe the virtual physiological human, it, it is that it, it should be descriptive and therefore diagnostic. Uh, it should be integrative. It should, it should integrate all of the knowledge that we have about the individual. And of course, it's a model. And why do you model? It's because you're trying to predict the future. So it should be predictive. And those are the, the key points from this slide. It's got a long history. Uh, the first workshop at which uh, this, this term, virtual physiological human, was coined was in Brussels in October 2004. And as a result of that, about a dozen people were asked to go to Barcelona in 2005. And we were allowed to show just two slides each. So this was one of my two slides. Of course, it was very dense. But even back then, we were saying, well, we must catalog and formalize our data. We must understand whether these data are representative of an individual. Uh, is the individual in health or disease? And we must exploit the clinical databases. And then really, we are modelers. So we need to apply tools. And, and again, back in 2005, uh, we were very good at the physics, the, 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 the history of the physics uh, simulation in aerospace, of course. Uh, but we were increasingly recognizing the need to, to model the chemistry and the biology too. And, and we published a white paper. And we were fortunate enough that the European Commission, uh, Elias Yakovides in particular, was a driver funded this to the tune of about 265 million euros. And I will show you some of the, the outputs from this, this program. So these are the timelines from 2004. And this, this document was published by Peter Hunter and others in 2010. And this was the ambition. And we're now in 2019. So according to this ambition, we should be impacting on the public. And I, I think that we are uh, fairly well on schedule here. We might be one or two years delayed, but we're about where this, this timeline suggested. In Horizon 2020, the emphasis switched to in silico medicine, in silico trials, and the digital patient. And I'll certainly tell you more in the next few minutes about the digital patient. If I were to tell you what we are proud of in our community, firstly, the Virtual Physiological Human Institute. We established that seven or eight years ago, and it was a genuine community effort. There is no funding for this, other than that is, that is provided by the members. And we did self-organize, and we, we do continue to exist. Even when the primary funding stopped at the end of Framework 7, we still continue. And I think it, perhaps an even bigger success is the Avicenna Alliance, or rather, the fact that we've evolved from primarily an academic institution in the VPH Institute to being industry-led and industry-driven in the Avicenna Alliance. And I think that's a big step forward. And Stig is one of the uh, primary players in the Avicenna Alliance. And I, I, I think we should be proud of that. But we also, also need to keep our eye on this goal. Impact has to be now. So if I were to summarize 
the scope of computational medicine. This slide, for me, about sums it up. Uh, I'm going to show three applications, the green dots, one in device design and two in uh, diagnosis and interventional planning. But I, I think for me, one of the huge questions we, we, we need to challenge ourselves with is this question of sufficient accuracy and the difference between man time and compute time. Man time now is very cheap. Sorry, compute time is very cheap. Man time is very expensive. And uh, we need to analyze all of our processes and see how long the individual, the man, has to sit and work for to produce a diagnosis. Uh, and we are less concerned now about the computer time, although still many of our simulations are complex and could run for several days, even weeks, even months on a supercomputer. So we need to, we need to think about what we're going to deliver and when we're going to deliver it. So I'm just going to go through three applications. The first of them is in cervical screening, and it really is perhaps one of the easiest uh, applications, not, not, not the, the context of cervical screening, but the context of device design. Because device design generally works on averages, it, it, it's not trying to work on an individual, it's not trying to represent an individual, uh, it's trying to represent a cohort, and therefore some of the challenges are lower. But of course that's what industry has been doing for the past, as long as there's been computers, designing for the average. So this is a very old application. The paper that we published uh, was back in 2004. Uh, and it was inspired really by uh, John Tidy, clinician, who was obviously, he's focused on cervical cancer. And he was concerned, he is concerned about the tests that are done, the screening programs. And one of the questions for the modelers was, we all know that the electrical impedance of tissue changes, uh, and the question is, can we use that as a screening tool? And particularly in the modeling, can we design a device that is the most sensitive to uh, cancerous changes or precancerous pre changes in the tissue? So in this particular case, this is the background. Uh, as cervical cancer starts, the first sign is that the uh, cuboidal cells at the basement membrane start to uh, move upwards. Uh, they, it, it, in the normal state, they become flattened uh, and tight near the surface. Uh, as cancer starts in the precancerous stages, uh, these cells migrate upwards. And because uh, the, the, the electrical properties of tissue are such that at low frequencies, the current has to make its way around the cells. It doesn't go effectively through the cell membranes. And so it's got very tortuous paths, and therefore the resistance is very high. But uh, as you go up in frequency, the resistance drops because the cell membranes start to pass the current, and so the, 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 the overall resistance is reduced. Uh, so this is a, an observation that's got nothing to do with modeling. And these are the clinical data on the right that show that uh, as you get this, this disorder of the cellular structure, so you can see it in the resistance. So the question was, again, long time ago, 2004, can we create a realistic computer model of the normal abnormal tissues through these stages uh, towards invasive cancer? Uh, can we qualitatively, sorry, quantitatively relate structural changes uh, to the impedance spectrum? And can we improve our data collection system, electrode array, frequency range, to make it more sensitive to these changes? And Dawn, uh, I showed on the previous slide, did her PhD uh, on finite element modeling of these stages. So uh, if you want the design of the electrode array, to improve the sensitivity. So, very old work. But in 2019 now, uh, you can visit this website, Zillico. It was founded in 2006, uh, following this collaboration between uh, the university and the hospital group in Sheffield. And 
they're now seller device. And it's interesting for me to see that, that you know, this work was done in 2004, but it's only in the past three to five years that the company has really started to win the innovation awards and translate this to the clinic. If you're interested in this, I, I would really ask you to have a look at the video. I, I found it very interesting watching. I haven't been associated with this for, for more than 10 years now. Uh, and it's interesting there is a Norwegian connection uh, here in Oslo. There are only three members of the Scientific Advisory Board, and one of them is very local. Uh, but it, I, it's very clinical. There are a lot of nurses on their video describing the, the use of this technology. It's very nice, but for me it also speaks to how long it takes to go through this cycle from the observations and the research to the uh, uh, manifestation as part of our National Health Service. So I'm now going to go on to the, to the other applications. They're, these are much more in my own domain of expertise. Uh, but first, can I just reflect on what the challenges are with clinical data? Well, those of you that are dealing with clinical data every day will recognize all of this. Uh, it's heterogeneous. There's all types of clinical data, image data, electronic health record data. And for me, one of the things that our community took a long time to learn was how serious we need to be about organizing these data and making these data accessible to the researchers. So I, I, I'm going to keep coming back to the, to the challenge of uh, an appropriate clinical reference information model. You're all also very aware of the quality of the data. The data is, is often contradictory. We make two measurements, sometimes 10 minutes apart and they're different. Uh, we make a measurement with ultrasound, we make a, ma a measurement with magnetic resonance imaging, it's different. The, the, the clinician all of the time is challenged with trying to make sense of contradictory data. And, and the worst thing for us is that the population is so uneven. There's masses of data, and for the modelers, most of it is irrelevant. We actually have relatively little reliable physiological data collected to underpin our models. And, uh, and, and that really is one of the challenges for us. And then, of course, uh, access is, is, is always an issue. Appropriate uh, methods for populating our research databases from the clinical databases. Uh, those of us that have worked in engineering uh, are often not used to some of the security implications for medical data. And of course, there's a, there's a strong legal and ethical framework. Another issue is that amongst this mass of data, there is often data that's really important to us, but we're really bad at interpreting it. So examples here. Uh, the patient has diabetes. I do cardiovascular modeling. What do I care about diabetes? Well, in fact, a lot, because diabetes has a lot of implications uh, for the vascular structure. So it's not even serious if I start to populate a model for cardiovascular application and I don't recognize that the patient has this condition. Another thing, and I, I, perhaps my biggest message for today, I, I, I'm absolutely focused on this physiological envelope. When we design an aeroplane, we know how many times it's going to take off. We know what the loads on takeoff are. We know about the loads on landing. We know about level flight. We know about turbulence and buffeting loads. And we design what we call the flight envelope in our performance department. And we pass that to our stress office so that they can analyze the aircraft under the appropriate conditions that it will see in its service life. In medical applications, we we just don't do it. We make a few measurements in the clinic, usually under rest conditions, and sort of somehow assume that that's representative of the patient. It's not representative. You, you have a cere cerebral aneurysm. It will rupture when you have sex or when you go to the toilet. It won't rupture when you're sat in the, in, on the sofa. So why don't we have a, a, a good representation, a good and formal representation of the physiological status of each individual that we're seeking to model? And more than anything, I, I, I'm so keen that we, we really develop formal processes for representation of the physiological or flight, human flight envelope. Uh, it's complex and uh, we're increasingly interested in personalization of models to represent an individual. So I, again, I will come back to that. 
Uh, it's not straightforward, and often the data to support it is sparse. And we also need to recognize that some of the models we'd like to run still require very large amounts of compute time. And so I think we need to focus increasingly on the use of these reduced order models. And perhaps the thing that I've found most surprising in the past maybe two to three years is how good these reduced order models are. They're linear. Our processes are horribly nonlinear, but they work. So I'm going to talk about this fractional flow reserve application. This is a, uh, I'm going to show a few slides from a presentation given by Paul Morris. Uh, he's now a consultant cardiologist in our hospital. He was a research fellow with us. The decision tree for coronary intervention, uh, you get chest pain, uh, you have a few investigations, and primarily there are two pathways. One is where you do CT, one is where you do coronary angiography. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about both of them, uh, but coronary angiography is, is when you are presented in the catheterization lab and we will do an intervention now. So we have, if, if we're going to make use of modeling, we have to model now and re return results in the next 10 minutes. So what is FFR? Well, it, it, it's a, a genius measure from the Eindhoven group. Uh, maybe 15 years or so ago now, and basically what they're saying is that we can predict the effect of a coronary lesion, so this is a narrowing of the coronary artery uh, on the blood supply to the heart by a really simple two-resistor analog. So basically we say the distal vasculature, all that in the pink circle, has a particular resistance. The proximal vasculature uh, is compromised by, by a lesion, a, a stenosis, and the question is, if we were to remove the stenosis by perhaps stenting, uh, how much flow could we restore to the distal vasculature? And we estimate that, clinically, by measuring the gradient across the stenosis, and we assume that we can, we can make that gradient zero and therefore apply the full pressure to the distal vasculature. So it's a, 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 a genius, simple measure. Uh, and the point is that if you have exactly the same stenosis but different distal vasculature, you'll get a different measure. So this patient, or these two, the top one has very healthy vasculature and therefore if you remove the stenosis, you will really restore a lot of flow. The second one has compromised distal vasculature, and therefore the benefit of the intervention will be less. So the, the wonderful thing about FFR is that it doesn't measure only anatomy, it measures physiology, it measures the capacity to restore flow. And two identical anatomical stenoses have very different uh, fractional flow reserves, and therefore very different predicted effective intervention. And these measures have been really well validated in the, the, the very best journals. Uh, there is massive evidence that if your coronary treatment is guided by fractional flow measurement, you will benefit. Nevertheless, in the UK, about 5% of people have this measurement made. If I have a coronary stenosis, I want the measurement. Why? Well, it takes more time in the cath lab, and we need an invasive pressure wire. And in the end, it costs more money, and I think that's the primary issue with, with FFR. So, the question is, <coughs> can we simulate FFR? And the answer is, we can. Uh, in these days now, uh, we can take our angiography, uh, we can do a segmentation from the angiography. Uh, we can, from the segmentation, build a computer model. We can apply appropriate boundary conditions to that model. And we can estimate what the pressure gradient is across the stenosis. So we can make the computational measure without the invasive pressure wire. And we published this uh, in, back in 2013, so six years ago now. Uh, where for 22 patients or 22 lesions, we showed 
that there was a good correlation between our angiography-based measurements and the, uh, the clinical measurement. In fact, with respect to just a specific threshold, uh, the intervention threshold, I think for this, this cohort we got no patients wrong, which was very nice for publishing a paper. But what's behind it? Well, uh, we did learn when we did our cerebral aneurysm project at the beginning of the VPH program, we said to our clinicians, tell us everything you know about cerebral aneurysms. We'll formalize that knowledge. We'll build a database. We'll represent all those concepts. And they gave us 2,300 concepts. And no patient was adequately populated. Typically, we had about 100 measurements for any one patient. So we learned from that. Now we have 200. And we have a, a database which is reliable, searchable, auditable, available and it's really good. Uh, if you want to know about the challenges, I would refer you to this paper in Jack Cardiovascular Interventions, but there remain challenges in, in every part, and not least of which is the representation of the uncertainty in the system. This is just to show that we're not always uh, very bright. We, we chose to show this, or Julian, who's now my boss, he's an interventional cardiologist, uh, suggested that we show this at the uh, ACI. Uh, so, so we live beamed from our cath lab uh, a, a, an operation on an individual, and we said that we would show our computational results before we made the measurement. And believe me, for an N of one, I was so nervous because we could we could have been so wrong, and we could have set our research back a long time. But we got really lucky. And for this individual, we got the right answer. But that was chance. It wasn't, it wasn't science. Uh, but we showed that we could measure the FFR in a person uh, bef uh, computationally before we measured it, really. And this has really been exploited by uh, a company from the USA. Not, not our work. They did their own work completely independently and a priori. But... Uh, they are focused on a, a CT-based solution rather than an angiography-based solution. And so theirs is much more of a screening tool. But this is a, a wonderful success story. It is now uh, recommended by NICE, our National Institute for Clinical Excellence. Uh, it, is, it is partially funded by our Department of Health Accelerated Access Program. It is real innovation working in the clinic. Uh, and why is it so successful? Well, first, excellent science. Uh, uh, an excellent research group, Charlie Taylor's research group. Uh, it's simple. We all understand FFR. It's simple to understand and it's simple to interpret. It is a single threshold. Bigger than a number, more tests. Lower than a number, sorry. It, lo lower than a number, more tests. Bigger than a number, it's okay. Uh, there was also a, 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 a the genius behind this was that unlike so many of our computational measures, we didn't have to prove by doing a clinical trial that this measure was valuable. The clinical data was already there that the invasive measure was valuable, and we only needed to reproduce that invasive measure. So the challenge to uptake, the barrier to uptake was much lower. But still, a financial case has to be made for the uptake. And, you know, the, 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 this isn't straightforward. Uh, it's a massive thing, of course, to get NICE approved, but, but this is a huge success. My final application is your valve. Uh, this is a, a, a European project that, that I have the honor to lead. Uh, and really, its key propositions were very similar. We're inspired by coronary fractional flow reserve. For heart valve disease, we measure the, the gradient across the valve, and we make for aortic stenosis. We, we, we measure the gradient across the valve and we say, should we intervene? And it doesn't make sense. Surely, just like the coronary FFR, we should be saying, but what is the impact of this local disease process on the system's physiology? So we need a system's model. And so that inspired it. Can we actually predict the benefit to the patient systematically or at systems level, as opposed to just measure the local gradient or, 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 or the local uh, 
regurgitation if it's a mitral case. So, simple method, personalize a few parameters, do some CFD, uh, compute some cardiac work parameters, and see if they correlate to outcome. So that's what we sought to do. Uh, and of course, we can, the benefit of the model is we can model the intervention and see uh, what we predict the improvement will be. Uh, there is a video here, please watch that if you're interested. Uh, it shows all of our senior people in the project. Uh, we're all very bad at presenting, I'm afraid. We, we look so wooden and artificial. But, uh, but at least we talk about the science of it. So this is what it's about. Uh, it's about a, a, a systems model with a local three-dimensional component that, 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 that represents the part of, of, of interest to us, which is the, the valve that we're seeking to intervene on. But the, the important thing, or two important things, one is that it is fed and exploits all of the data that is available on the patient and on the population. So it's underpinned by a lot of data. And it's exploited in a decision support system delivered into the clinic. Th th those are the critical issues. And it, 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 you said about the uh, need for a good consortium. Uh, it's a nice balanced consortium, three clinics across Europe, uh, some of the major industrial players, ANSYS, Philips, uh, and appropriate academic uh, membership, plus uh, Terenva, who are a small, medium enterprise in France who are really translating this technology. So once again, I can't say how much it's important, in my opinion, that we have a formal information model. We need to have these data and concepts, and we need to map between the, 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 the clinical data and concepts, in, in your valve we had nine tables of those, and the computational concepts. We need to make sure respect, we're, we're speaking the same language, and that we populate the model appropriately. This slide tries to emphasize the need for a really strong underpinning data and compute infrastructure. We have strong data infrastructure. We have, in this case, we had Prometheus, a supercomputer in Poland, a major uh, computational infrastructure. We have the threads of computational modeling, uh, which includes, uh, of course, a formal analysis strategy, machine learning, model personalization, and model execution. Uh, we have the clinical arm where we do the trials, uh, and we feed it all into this decision support system. And something else for me here, it was really important that our DSS didn't only present model results. There's a lot of history and knowledge in clinical guidelines, in case-based reasoning. We should present all of it. We shouldn't, the system should be, should be complete. It shouldn't just be a modeling system. And, uh, I don't have time to cover this, but, but we, we consider that we made uh, significant advances in uh, using exploiting activity measured in the home environment, in reduced order modeling, uh, and in uncertainty representation and interpretation. And we, we developed a very formal process, a seven stage process, which we applied uh, to all patients in this particular study uh, we recruited 169 patients, and we successfully processed 161. So, again, I think one of the advantages of big European projects is that we can. Uh, we don't just do a handful. We don't just do five or ten. We do enough to actually get some, some meaningful data. This shows an illustration of the processing of a case. Uh, but we can compute the work that the heart's doing, the peak power the heart is expending, and we can predict how they might change under an intervention. And this just shows a very simple representation of the benefit of intervention in terms of the pressure volume relationship in the left ventricle for this patient. The point of the model is that it's quantitative, 16% reduction in power expenditure, 6% reduction in peak power, and an 8% increase in cardiac output. You'll all be, all be very familiar. Uh, often we need to communicate our results. And I, I find whenever I'm talking about cardiac power, it's, it's good to talk in terms of how many Mars bars uh, you need to, to power your heart. And it's surprisingly little. Uh, a tenth of a Mars bar will power your heart for about a day. 
we don't have time, as I said, but uh, in Eurovar, we really did seek to measure the physiological envelope of the patient. Uh, we measured using wearable devices and using instrumentation in their home, what they did every day. And we personalized our model, not only in the rest state, but also uh, in the more extreme excursions in the physiological envelope of that individual. And I think that's really important. And we've got some numbers. Uh, we'll show these for the first time in a couple of weeks uh, at the Heart Val Society Young Investigator Award in London. But uh, <coughs> Gareth will talk next week, and I, I can't show the data yet, uh, about correlations between uh, the your valve uh, predictions and the physically measured six-minute walk test, which is really nice. Another important thing, we did a... a, a a randomized control experiment. We exposed this to uh, 12 from the Department of Surgery in the hospitals and 33 from the Department of Cardiology. And it was, it was nice to see that in terms of their assessment of the acceptance, uh, the simulation was the worst. It's the only one with, with uh, any no value, but that was only three people. And generally, given that the the guidelines, the clinical guidelines and the risk scores are, are, are used every day. We think that the acceptability of the uh, simulation data to these clinicians who were introduced to it often for the first time is very good. And, and more than 50% of them said it was useful. And when we compared the recommended procedure for the individual between uh, a case where they didn't have this DSS support, decision support system support, uh, and where they did, there was a significant change often in their uh, suggestion for what intervention should be done. Uh, no patient had their decision made using this software, it's experimental. But uh, two interesting points, one is that it tended to suggest a more conservative treatment plan. Often, they decided just to watch instead of to intervene. Secondly, without exception, really, uh, the, 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 the cohort who did this test said that they had increased confidence in the, in the decision that they made. So I won't repeat the conclusions, but these, for me, are all important. Physiological envelope, reduced order modeling, uh, interpretation. So we hope that soon uh, this will, Terenva already has software for heart valve interventions. Uh, currently it's image and anatomy based. Uh, we hope that soon it will have the uh, model based support as well as part of their product. I'd like to finish now with uh, <clears throat> just a, a brief mention of a project uh, that, that's uh, running in, in NTNU now, and really that is many of the same ideas as your valve, but with a stronger focus now on taking it into the community and addressing a much uh, bigger disease cohort, i.e. hypertension. Uh, so this is the summary of the project. It is, it is seeking to exploit physiological envelope data measured on individuals as they live their lives uh, to operate a model. One of the questions is, uh, can we quantify and predict the benefits of exercise on individual patients? Uh, and, and, and the project is running. It's one year in now. First measurements were actually made last week. But this is some preliminary data that suggests that if we measure and personalize a model in the rest state, so that's the thing on the bottom, the, the measures are black, the personalized, the personalized model is the, the blue prediction. Uh, we can extrapolate that to the exercise state just using the computational model. And, and that's promising. We've written a number of position papers and uh, uh, if you're interested, please please have a look through those. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank all my friends and collaborators, and thank you very much again for the opportunity.